mixer, I think. Good morning. Shalom, y'all. Yeah, that's a southern Hebrew. Southern, southern Hebrew. I, I, I bring you greetings from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, where the hills are steep, the lakes are deep, and the turkeys run squirrely. I don't know if you got, did you get a turkey? Yeah? Just the last few days? I didn't. Uh, we had um, chicken at our place, and it tasted <laughs> like chicken. <laughs> yeah, and secretly, you know, I didn't say anything because my son made it and he did a great job, but I was secretly hoping for tacos. I don't know if that makes me, you know, unpatriotic or what, but we, we had a good meal. I, I hope you did too. It's good to be here. Uh, according to academic uh, sources and one particular authoritative source, uh, Good Housekeeping Magazine, 88% um, of uh, turkeys eat Americans on Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that Brett needs somebody else to write this material. I <laughs> haven't a clue. Where do you get this stuff, Brett? He's not even here to defend himself. Anyway, thanks to Brett and thanks to Brennan and thanks to Madison and Pat and all of the others for making my visit here possible. While I have not been on your campus before, campuses before, uh, I have shared some falafel with more than a few of you on some of our uh, Bible lands trips. We got any uh, alum? Yeah, there's one hand. Yeah, falafel indeed, or shawarma. Those are your two choices. That's it. Hummus on the side. Anyway, um, I've enjoyed your company in the past, and as was said just a moment ago by Brennan, I look forward to traveling with another New Life crew here in the new, near future, near future. But right now, I've been charged to open up a short study titled, Truth Matters. And it's a timely exercise, and I think we probably all know the reason why. I can't imagine a moment when the idea of absolute truth has been more unfashionable. From politics to scholarship, we're inundated with the idea that truth is an intensely personal affair. And that ain't bad. But what ain't good is the bleed out. And it runs something like this. Because truth has become everybody's private property, get off my lawn, it's viewed as personally, but not collectively valid. Your truth is your truth. His truth is her, his truth. Her truth is her truth. Our truth is our truth. Their truth is their truth, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. The idea that there is an absolute truth, an umbrella that covers and protects and governs us all, is a casualty of the culture wars. And that umbrella has seemingly folded up. It's collapsed. At least that's where we seem to be, morally anyway. There's no right, there's no wrong for everybody. It's just all perception. <laughs> and it's sad. And it's illogical. Denying absolute truth might work in the college classroom or on the bar stool or in a celebrity interview. But I wouldn't try it on a policeman who pulls you over because you just ran a red light on the way home from church. <laughs> That's not my truth, you argue, waving your finger at the stoplight. Really, replies the patrolman with a raised eyebrow. <laughs> and that's because deep down, Deep down, we all know better. 
Truth matters. And while unfashionable, the idea of absolute truth is the only thing that stands between us and utter chaos. It's foundational for science, for theology, for archaeology, for a functioning society, for future hope. We don't drive willy-nilly through stoplights, not for long anyway. Only somebody crazy enough to believe in an absolute truth would get in an airplane. You gonna trust those wings to lift you up into the bosom of the sky? <laughs> As Sir Isaac Newton, who was a fair mathematician of yesteryear, once quipped, the creator is apparently quite skilled in mechanics and geometry. <laughs> Are you still with me? Yeah. So what's the plan here? We have to be ruthlessly efficient given our time. Let's try this. To begin, I want to look at the truth claims of Jesus that are found in the book of John. And then we're going to back the truck up to the text of the Old Testament. And there in the book of Isaiah, we'll discover the rootage of Jesus' claims. Here's my goal. By looking at these bits of Scripture, we'll see the need for truth that is consistent through the ages, revealed in the identity and work of the Messiah, and capable of offering real hope for the future, for you and for me. Sound like a plan? Yeah. Let's try it. Let's begin with the truth claim of Jesus that's found in the Gospel of John. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he engaged his followers in a heart-wrenching discussion, and it's recorded for us in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. This discussion is sometimes called the farewell discourse. And it was colored by developments that were swirling around their position like a storm. They ate the Last Supper. Judas left the room to go meet with the authorities. Peter insisted that he was unshakable. And the fire flickered and the shadows danced as the end drew near. Jesus would be dead in 24 hours. In his farewell, the words that we find at the start of chapter 14 are absolutely startling because of their hope. I'm leaving, he said, but let not your hearts be troubled, anxious, all stirred up and fluttery. And listen to what follows. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen me. Philip, his turn, said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you for so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of of the works themselves. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. As we reflect on Jesus' exchanges with Thomas first and then with Philip, 
there are two ideas that rise to the surface. Both are triggered by truth claims. One swirls around identity, and the other swirls around relationships. Uh, the emphasis on identity is prompted by the panic of Thomas. He seems to have been the <clears throat> grumpy realist among them. You're leaving us. Show us which way to go. And Jesus leaned into his panic, even as he leans into our panic too. He doesn't say, which way? Mm, well, that's a good one. <laughs> you see that way over there? You know, go all the way down there, uh, two rights and, and a left. Give that a go. See where it, see where it ends up. No. And neither did he say, ah, boy, bae, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. All roads lead to the same place, right? No. Jesus said, I am the way. The, the hados in Greek, the pathway. I am the truth, the aletheia, the real deal that which is reliable and authentic and absolute. I am the life, the zoe, that which moves and grows and has vigor inside. You see, these are all claims about messianic identity. And they have an edge that is both inclusive as well as exclusive. The inclusive is easy enough to see. The words and the mission of Jesus offer hope to all of us sitting here in the room, and then some. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't even matter what you've done. The kingdom of God, my friends, is a party, and we are invited. It's the exclusivist bit that we get hung up on. And that's because the words of John 14 fly in the teeth who say, of, of those who say uh, there is no difference between Buddha or Muhammad or Marx or Freud or Darwin or Jesus. No. Jesus pushes back. The only way to the Father is through me. There are no back doors. I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. You know, whenever Jesus says, in the book of John anyway, whenever he says, I am, his contemporary critics loaded their fists with rocks. And our contemporaries do the same thing. His critics did it because they thought he was being blasphemous. Ours do it because they find his words to be unfashionable. A bit narrow. You know, we prefer options. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if believers, and I'm including myself in this, I sometimes wonder if believers have somehow brought this down onto our own heads. You know, we've been guilty of presenting Jesus arrogantly to others, woodenly even. If you're listening to my voice today and sitting on the fence, perhaps, can I give you a challenge? Don't take my word for it, or Pat's word, or Brett's word, or anybody else's word, for that matter. Read the text for yourself and discover a different kind of Jesus. He doesn't come with arrogance. You know what? Before making that identity claim, I am the way, before that claim, he washed his disciples' feet and he instructed those who were there in the room to do the same. He said, I'm giving my life for the sheep as a good shepherd. That doesn't feel very arrogant or self-serving to me. And what's more, his words in verse 10 of the passage we have before us counter any charge of blasphemy or authoritarianism. Jesus says, I do not speak on my own of myself, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. These works 
his miracle erase the charge of blasphemy? Who can do these things but God alone? That his power is derived or borrowed from the Father erode the charge of authoritarianism. Hmm. Let's keep going. Mention of the Father prompts the second swirl of this farewell discourse, the emphasis on relationships. Thomas panics. You're leaving us. Show us the way. Philip, another disciple, runs in a different direction. You're leaving us. Show us the Father. Don't go before giving us his number. I need him in my contacts. <laughs> Jesus replied to Philip, as in essence, you've already got it. You have all that you need. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. I am the outworking of the Father. It's like we share a web page. And it makes me wonder if we could somehow restart or, or flip the process. Might some of our uneasiness, might some of our struggle with absolute truth go away? I mean, here's the rub. We build images of who or what God the Father is around the imperfect actions and words of others. And we build our notions of who or what God is on the ground of sloppy traditions and preconceptions. We start with a lumpy idea about God the Father, and then somehow we try to wedge God the Son into the same frame. Jesus says to Philip, reverse the process. You have what you need. Start with my words and my actions and move from there to God. You see, that's the corrective. Watch, hear, and know me. Then you can watch, hear, and know the Father. Travel from the known to the unknown, from the near to the distant, from the touchable to the untouchable. That's the stuff of John chapter 14. It's the stuff of Messiah of identity and relationships and process. Begin afresh with the Gospels. You guys are kind of quiet. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've had a week to think about these words. Okay, that's a lie. Maybe three days. <laughs> to think about these words, and now you've had 15 minutes. You need to breathe. It's halftime, okay? Everybody breathe. <laughs> big breath in, big breath out. Okay, halftime's over. <laughs> Here's an idea for you. What if I told you that the elements of John chapter 14 were anticipated some 800 years previously? Follow me from John to Isaiah from truth claims issued in the Roman period to truth claims written down in the age of iron. Deep within the prophetic bowels of Scripture, we find the book of Isaiah. Yesha Yahu! And because of repeated mentions of a coming Messiah, Mashiach, the anointed one, Israel's special king, some have described Isaiah as the gospel of the Old Testament. What's the message of Isaiah in a nutshell? Well, let me give it to you, what I think it is anyway. It is the announcement of catastrophic failure as well as an amazing promise. The catastrophic failure is this. Israel has not measured up to its identity and mission to be the people of Yahweh for the sake of the world. And this failure has consequences. The people of Yahweh will lose their independence, they're going to lose their land, they're going to lose their temple and be dissolved into exile. Boom! I mean, it's a real blow. But there's an amazing promise in Isaiah as well. 
You know, God has a yes to every one of our no's. God has an answer to our failure. And in this case, Yahweh's answer to Israel's failure is in the word, Messiah, the anointed one. And paradoxically, this coming king is referred to in the text as a servant. From king to servant. That's high to low, baby. Listen carefully, and I know this is kind of tough, but I think this is key to understanding the announcement of Isaiah. King Messiah, the servant, will singularly take on the role of Israel. He will pull together Israel's collective history, Israel's story, Israel's personality. He'll pull all of that together in just one body, one small body, and he will do that which the people of Yahweh would not or could not do. He will become ultimate Israel. And he will accomplish the mission of Yahweh for the sake of the world, but in a most unexpected way. It's a risky, shocking, even horrifying proposal. For this reason, King Messiah is sometimes called the suffering servant in Isaiah. And everything that I just told you, you can find for yourself in the four or five servant songs that are recorded in the second half of the book of Isaiah. I wish we could work through them all. We're going to have to come back another time, another month of, uh, of Isaiahic study. But instead, let's just focus on one today. That's all we have time for, just, just one. It's found in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And in it, we discover the rootage of Jesus' claims, the claims we just read about in John, both in terms of identity and relationship. This first servant song reaches our eyes and our ears as words that are coming from the lips of Yahweh himself. It's a poem, cast in first person, lyrical in character, and it's preceded by a rant, and it's followed by a reminder. The rant is against the false gods. The reminder indicts Israel yet one more time for their failure to be the people of Yahweh. And between these two posts are words that identify, empower, and announce Yahweh's suffering servant. Let's have a look at them, each package, one at a time. In the first package, the suffering servant is identified, verses 1 through 4. It goes like this. This is my own translation, so it may not align exactly with the screen. Sorry about that. Behold my servant, whom I support, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make, his, make it heard in the streets. A damaged reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. In truth, or by means of truth, he will bring forth justice. He will not wear out. He will not walk away until he has established justice on the ground underfoot, and even the most distant places wait for his Torah. This opening salvo almost does the heavy lifting for the entire poem. And as the lights go down and the curtains are drawn back, the spotlight illuminates a single figure standing on stage. Bum -ba -da -dum. And a voice rings out, here is my servant. You've been waiting for him for a long time, since Eden already. And notice how Yahweh describes a special relationship with his servant. He's mine. I hold him up. I support him. I choose him. He is my delight. And if you're quiet, you can almost hear New Testament echoes. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. 
it kind of makes you wonder, do you think Jesus ever read Isaiah? (laughs) And if he did, how would that have affected him personally? This first package from the servant song identifies Messiah as Yahweh's chosen one. And for our purposes, which are brief, here, uh, note just two things. Both are found in verse 3. First, note that the servant is tender. He's not arrogant. He's not a ramrod. He's not a reed buster. He's not a lamp blower outer. But he's absolutely and deadly determined. He's on a mission. Second, note that by means of truth, emmet, that's the Hebrew word that's used there, emmet, by means of truth, note that the servant will faithfully, patiently, firmly, and reliably usher in justice. Mishpat. Absolute truth puts things right. That's why we need it. Truth matters. It clarifies our confusion. And don't be fooled by his tenderness either. Our God and our Savior are committed to justice, not just for one segment of the population, but for everybody. Even the distant places, the islands, listen and tremble with anticipation. You see, the first package of Isaiah chapter 42 uh, has for us the identification of the suffering servant. And the second package, the suffering servant is empowered. Keep reading. Look at verses 5 through 7. Thus says God, Yahweh, who created the sky and stretched it out tightly and spread out the ground and all that comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and energy to all those who walk around on it. I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness, he says to Messiah. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a promise for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind and to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison house, those who sit in the dark. (laughs) Do you ever play with electricity? Yeah, oh yeah, I did. I did a lot of stupid stuff as a kid. We used to have cows and electric fences. And we used to dare each other, you know, to touch the wires with posts and with sticks and with corn cobs and with fingers. How close can you go before the the power flow, right? It's not an accident that this section begins with Yahweh's resume. I am powerful. I am creator, says God. I am electric. And then Yahweh speaks directly into the ear of the servant, and he's linked to him. I have taken you by the hand. Yeah. That creative power surges, and the servant lights up. He lights up the darkness. He lights up the prison house. He lights up the nations. Oof. You remember? Back to John 14 when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We share a webpage. We're connected. (laughs) We're connected electrically. All of that which is anticipated, all of that which we read in John chapter 14 is anticipated here. God the Father says to God the Son, I'm holding your hand. And to what end? In order to bring about light and freedom. Can you see it? The suffering servant is identified and empowered. In the third and final package that we have here in this first servant song, the servant is announced. Listen to what it says. I am Yahweh. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have happened. New things I declare to you, even before they happen. Now, again, keep in mind that this stuff is being crafted in the 8th century, you know, almost 800 years before the time of Christ. Already, Yahweh and the people of God have a track record. But man, that's old stuff, 
old stuff. Here, Isaiah announces new stuff, a new way forward. And failed Israel will not be dumped or replaced, but rather brought to full flower in the body and in the person of Messiah. Remember what Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but what? To fulfill them. Yeah, it's being fulfilled right here before our eyes. By becoming ultimate Israel, Messiah will gather to himself the sin of all the world and then be crushed as a perfect sacrifice. That's the horrifying bit. This new thing which is being rolled out here is more fully commented upon in the fourth and final servant song, Isaiah chapter 53. Remember, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his stripes, by his bruises, we are healed. Yahweh has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 verses 5 through 6. By means of his death and resurrection, King Jesus can say with authority and without arrogance, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This is not said in judgment. Jesus is the way to God because he is the truth of God, the revelation, the reflection of God. His identity and mission are wrapped up and taped up in a Christmas present to you and to me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the message that is found here in the Gospel of John and there in the Gospel of Isaiah. We so need your truth today. And I pray, Father, that we be faithful transmitters of your priorities to the world around us. May we continue to usher in the kingdom of God in the places where we are as we speak, to your, as we speak your truth and as we share your love. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.